Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Xamarin University guest lecture. My name is Rob Gibbons, and I'm very pleased to welcome you back to school. So it's September, summer's over, the kids are all going back to school, and Xamarin University is kicking into high gear this month. This month, we are going to have new classes, a bunch of lightning lectures, and today is the first of four guest lectures that we're happy to bring you. Uh, we really hope you take advantage of all that Xamarin University has to offer in September and in every month. So today we have James Montemagno joining us to show us how to use and develop plugins for Xamarin. James is a developer evangelist here at Xamarin. I'm sure lots of people uh, have met him. He's all over the place. I'll let James introduce himself. And we definitely encourage questions during the guest lecture. James will answer those at the end of the presentation. So you can put in your questions whenever you want. You can use the go to training uh, control panel there. Ask your questions at the end of the uh, lecture. James will go through and answer all of those. All right, so James, go ahead and take it away. Cool, thanks, Rob. Uh, it's really great to be here on XAMU on today covering a whole lot of different aspects to plugins for Xamarin. I think that you know I've taken a lot of Xamarin University courses, and I'm sure a lot of you have as well. Uh, and often, even plugins for Xamarin are featured as part of the Xamarin University training. And they're really unique and I wanted to highlight what kind of inspired the creation of plugins for Xamarin uh, earlier this year, and then also how you yourself can get up and running uh, easily to develop your own plugins, either internally for your own company, your own apps, or distribute them on NuGet uh, and show them with the community. Uh, so if you don't know who I am, let me see if I can click through. There we go. If you're wondering who exactly James is and you haven't met me before, uh, well, it's a pleasure and an honor to meet every single one of you virtually on this uh, guest lecture. Uh, I like Rob said, I'm James Montemagno. I'm a developer evangelist here at Xamarin. Uh, I live in the beautiful, wonderful, sunshiny state of Washington in the beautiful city of Seattle, right near the Space Needle, right below it. So it's, it's right there. I guess we'll actually get to see some of it during some of the, 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 the plug-in demos, which will be very cool. I moved here four years ago, actually, not just to become a mobile developer, but actually for the coffee. Uh, and all I do is kind of drink coffee. If you follow me, I have coffee apps, coffee blogs, coffee everything. I check in on Swarm of coffee, coffee everywhere. It's all I do. And often I'm either talking about monkeys or coffee. Uh, it's kind of what I love. I'm already on my third cup this morning. I'm pretty jazzed. Uh, but most like I said, I did move to Seattle from Phoenix, originally from Cleveland, uh, to build and create mobile applications. It's what I love. It's my passion. And every single thing that I do, all the apps that I create, all the plugins I create are completely open source on my GitHub, and I simply love it. I fell in love with Xamarin four years ago, so much that I joined them two years ago as an evangelist. Uh, you can find me anywhere. James at Xamarin.com is my personal direct email line if you have any questions directly for me. At James Montemagno is my Twitter. It's the absolute easiest way to get a hold of me. I am on Twitter all the time, 24 hours a day, basically. I don't really sleep. Uh, and then on my own personal blog, not only do I blog for the Xamarin blog uh, and other numerous blogs around the web, but also my blog, Mots Codes. Uh, I get to talk about kind of open-ended things when I talk about like, like little hacks that I'm doing, little side projects I'm working on, a lot of interesting things. A, a lot around plugins and for some reason a, a lot around pull to refresh, which is really interesting, uh, especially in Xamarin Forms. Uh, and uh, if you visit that blog, I also do a live um, stream called Motsko's Live every single Friday at 9 a.m. Pacific. I'll be doing that tomorrow, so feel free to like find some more information over there. So I hope you do follow me, and feel free to ask me any question at any time, even after this webinar. I'm always here for you guys. That's my job. And plus, I just love it. Okay, so this is what I fall in love with, and probably what you've seen over and over again uh, in Xamarin University, which is Xamarin's unique approach to mobile development. And we're really building out that shared C-sharp backend, and, and normally that is all of our platform uh, independent code. When you think about it, it's our models, it's our view models, it's our RESTful uh, service calls, it's our SQL databases. It's things that are the same across all the different platforms. And often we shove those inside of a portable class library or shared code project. And, and usually that's just the .NET bits. When you think about it, you're just creating some classes and you're using maybe JSON.NET, deserializing some data. But that's our shared C-sharp back end of our code. And then up top are the bits and pieces for iOS, Android, of course, all of Windows and Mac, uh, where you're building and accessing those native APIs. So normally we can think of it like this. 
know, if you're a Windows developer, you have all those .NET libraries on the bottom here in gray, and this is just a subset of what's available naturally in .NET. But what we're seeing is things that, as .NET developers, we know and love. SystemNet, I.O., Link, XML. And then if you want to go to another platform, you, know, you download an SDK, you get going, you get Microsoft Phone, networking, storage, the platform-specific capabilities. Now, when you go to iOS or Android, it's exactly the same, right? You have that .NET business on the bottom that shared the same logic that, that exists on every single platform with, with Mono and Xamarin. And then up top is our iOS-specific APIs, iBeacon, Core Graphics, Core Motion, and of course, again, for Android, text-to-speech, action bar, printing framework, things like that. But again, that shared bottom piece is what's important here. You can almost think of the entire .NET framework and mono, mono runtime as a big plug-in for Xamarin. That's what I like to say. <laughs> if you think of it that way, it's our shared access. So when we talk about this approach, I often like to say, like, what, what is this stuff? You know, we often talk about creating the user interface or accessing the native APIs, but we don't often dive into exactly what this purple, green, and blue junk is up top. What does that actually mean? Well, th that is the platform-specific code. And this is code that you normally have to write three times because while some of the APIs, such as battery, GPS, or lights, or notifications, exist on all platforms, they all have different APIs. iOS has a different API to access this, Android, and of course Windows does. Now, of course, there's going to be some APIs, maybe Bluetooth or NFC or Apple Pay, that are very platform-specific. But often, most mobile devices or tablets all have the capability and the APIs to do very similar things. So normally, let's say we'll take the last example here of text-to-speech. Uh, it does exist on each and every single platform. And let's say I want to integrate that into my application. Well, on iOS, I'd probably write a method similar to something like this. I do want to use AV Speech Synthesizer on, on the core iOS API. And I pass it some text and the speech utterance, give it some you know, different voice and playback rates to give. Uh, and then I would speak that utterance back. So that would kind of be my work around there. And then, okay, I'm going to go over on Android. Oh, I've got to implement it again. So now I'm over here, and I have text-to-speech, which is the core Android API. And there's actually quite a bit more code that I couldn't fit on this slide, but the idea is you create a text-to-speech with the current context. You give it this dictionary to speak, and then you pass it back and forth. And this init call, if it is initialized, if it's not initialized, it's a little bit tricky. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of things going on over there on Android. Surprisingly... Windows, for most of the APIs, uh, at least on phone Silverlight, are pretty simple. So here we have a speech synthesizer. We just say speak back text async, which is very, very nifty. Now, there are a lot of different APIs, so this is just one method. Imagine if you need to gather the languages that are installed on the device, or you want to speak back some special text, or you want to subscribe to notifications when um, text has started or stopped. You would have to then implement that over and over again. But of course, what we're seeing here, if I even go back, that we're writing this three different times on iOS, Android, and Windows. Now, at this point, these are all be in the platform-specific code. So if you want to actually access this API from your shared portable class library or shared code project, you're going to have to write a common interface. So normally, this would look like something such as iText-to-Speech. And uh, if you actually go to the Xamarin Forms documentation on the dependency service, this is almost the exact example that you'll see from, uh, Craig is always talking about this, and he has iText-to-speech, and you resolve this out as a dependency service, and then you bring it back in, and you go through this cycle. But now imagine that you have to do this for every single uh, API that you want to access on the native platform. It gets really tedious really fast. And this is what I found four years ago when I started uh, my development was that it's amazing that I can access all of these, but now I have to go learn all the different APIs. There's four different APIs to learn, especially if you're doing store, or then you're doing RT. And then you got to come back and write this interface and try to abstract it out and go into town with it. So it gets a little tricky really fast. So we thought earlier this year, and it's always been in the back of our minds, especially when I started at Xamarin, is what if we had a way that our developers didn't have to write all this code? I don't want to write all this code. These are things that I'm doing over and over again on the different platforms. What if we didn't have to write all this code? And what if we could ensure that we could access all of these APIs from our portable class libraries and our shared code? For instance, 
let's take that exact speak. I want to speak back hello world. That's the API that I would like to access. That's what I want to integrate into my application. But what I want to have happen is when I still call speak, I want it to go down and call AB speech synthesizer. I want it to call the Texas speech APIs on Android. And I want it to call the speech synthesizer over on Windows. I want it to do the native functionality, but I want to call speak just one simple API. And that's what plugins for Xamarin and Windows are. It gives you a common API for things that are common across all the different platforms. So accessing camera, settings, GPS location, notifications, toast, um, a lot of different background services, things like that, things that are common across all the different platforms, connectivity, different device information, maps, um, vibration of the devices, things that all the devices can do. We give you a simple, common API to access all of these native features. Now, what's unique here is that uh, plugins for Xamarin uh, aren't all created by Xamarin. So I've created about 10 or 12 of them uh, since I started uh, kind of the, this, big, this big push of plugins for Xamarin. Uh, but a lot of them are actually created by the community. And that's kind of what I love about the .NET and the Xamarin community is that we're very open, very willing to help everybody, and we just love sharing our knowledge with the world. So a lot of the plugins that you'll find are actually community-driven. We had a big community contest uh, over the holidays for a big push in these. So you'll find about, I think, nearly almost 100 some odd plugins at this point spread out across NuGet. So this sounds basically too good to be true, and how would I actually get started with this? Well, let me show you. So I'm going to hop over here into uh, Xamarin Studio. Now, I'm creating a little application. I've just mocked it out just a little bit. Uh, with Xamarin Forms. And the core here is that I have this weather service. It's called MyWeather. And I have this little weather service, and it uses uh, HTTP client and JSON.net, and it uses open weather map to go and query uh, weather for a city. I can either pass it to latitude, longitude, or a specific city with specific units. Uh, it goes in, it formats that string. Uh, I get that string asynchronously from an HTTP client. And then I deserialize this weather route. Let's take a look at that really quick. There we go. And we can see there's like system, weather, main weather, wind, clouds. There's a whole lot of information that comes from this free API. Max temperature, min temperature. Very, very nice. OK. So let me just go ahead and run this. And we can take a look. Well, let's take a look first at the user interface. It's very, very simple right now. I'm using a nice little grid with a, with a whole bunch of you know, rows and columns. And what I have here is first an entry box, uh, and that's going to be tied and a lot of data binding here to my city that I enter, and we'll see if it's enabled if the use city boolean is set. And then I have a little switch here if I want to use the city or not, if I want my users to enter the city, or maybe I want to use the GPS location. Uh, and then down here I have a button that simply gets the weather, it calls the get weather command, and then I bind up the temperature, the location, and the condition. Pretty straightforward. Uh, as far as the user interface goes. It's not going to probably win any, win any weather application awards, but you know, I'm not mocking it out, POCing at this point in time. Let's take a look at our view model. And here's our view model. This kind of was I had up earlier. It just is a little weather view model. I have a weather service here and an I notify property changed. And we can see we have our very standard get sets on our city, a Boolean here to use the city. Uh, here is going to be our temperature, a big temperature to display, condition and location. So things that I'm data binding to back and forth. I have my property change notifications. It's looking pretty good. Uh, and then down here is that get weather command. And this is kind of the creme de la creme of where everything is happening. We're using lots of fancy C Sharp 6 features. Uh, if you're not using C Sharp 6, it's one of my, it's my favorite. I just gave a big talk on it. I'm very much excited about all the C Sharp 6 features. Uh, but what we're seeing here is that I go out, and right now I only have the ability to use the city. And I'm passing in the city here, which is going to be a string uh, with a get and set there. Uh, and then I grab the temperature. I cast it to an int, so it's nice and short, just a very integer version of the temperature. And then I make sure that I can grab the weather route. Lots of question marks, lots of Elvis operators in there. Uh, uh, and set the condition and the name. And then I have some weather message that I want to display at some point. OK, so let's run this here and see what it looks like. And we'll just spin it up here on iOS. Yeah. 
Perfect. Okay, so I simply just have an entry and a little switch here. I'm going to say, let's see what uh, Boston Mass is doing. Get weather, 72 degrees in Boston with moderate rain. Not bad. All right. So that's about all I can do. If I actually toggle this off, I'm un unable to get the weather because I haven't implemented any feature here. It's actually just going to throw an exception because this weather route, as we can see here, is going to be null. If I switch this back and do that, it's going to be the same thing, 72 degrees. All right, cool. So let's actually use some plugins. So at this point, I want to do two things. I want to be able to implement and get the GPS location, uh, and then I also want to speak back some text. For instance, the current temperature in this location there is this temperature. So let's go ahead and first I'm going to pull up Chrome here. And what I do is I usually go to github.com slash Xamarin slash plugins. And this is, isn't uh, a repository of plugins. It's just a nice readme page uh, with a list of plugins, what they are, what are available. What you can see here is you can find the name, a description, the NuGet package, GitHub, and who's created it. So for instance, we have contacts, cryptography, device motion, embedded resources. Uh, here's a geolocator. That looks pretty good. Let's pull up that, that GitHub and that NuGet. And this person here, he looks pretty trustworthy, so we'll go with him. Let's check out that guy. Um, and we'll need that, and then we'll also need text-to-speech. So, so let's go settings, sockets, and text-to-speech. All right, cool. That looks good. So here we go. So what I really like about plugins is that we ensured that kind of working with the community when plugins are being built, that they're open source under an MIT license, because we have an open source contributor license that we have, uh, and then also there's great documentation. So for instance here, here's the geolocator, and we can see that, hey, you need to install this, uh, this NuGet into your PCL project and your client projects. So that's very important when it comes to uh, PC or to plugins. And here's the API. I can say uh, crossgeolocator.current, desired accuracy 50, and a specific timeout amount here. You can actually grab this here. Let's do that. That looks good. Cool. And then it even tells you down here, hey, make sure that you set your access uh, course location and find location permissions. And in iOS, um, you're going to have to set and use some uh, request authorization. And you can see here, I have a, even have a log and Windows phone. You have to put in the location. So you have to get permission from the device. That's pretty good. Um, and we'll make sure that this developer is trustworthy. Let's look at him. He looks pretty like, adorable. Uh, he looks pretty trustworthy, pretty active on GitHub. Uh, all of you should probably follow him to make that go up to about 600. That'd be great. Uh, and, but here we go, Xamarin, Xamarin Plugins is the main repo. So we got that. We got the NuGet package. It's been downloaded 3,000 times. Probably pretty good. Um, Twitter's looking pretty good. You guys should probably follow him. Uh, and then we have text-to-speech. So this is what I really like about this plugin, is that it can not only just speak back text, but you have pitch, volume, speak rate, locale. Um, you can decide if you want to go into a speech queue or gather all available languages. And here's the API, speak. Now what I really like about plugins, and since they're all open source on GitHub, is that you can actually go into the code. So for instance, if I want to go into Android and look at the text-to-speech, here, here's the implementation. We can see that it inherits from a Java Lang object. It implements iText-to-speech. It's an i on it in it, i on in it listener, and it's i disposable. It has all these different things for cross location. There's an initialization, some logging going on here. It initializes the speech, and then here's the speak back that's going on here. What's nice is that you can go through all of this code and see what, I, what is going on in the plugin. So you see there's some different things happening in version 18 or above or lower versions, different things for Lollipop that are happening, and the speak back code that's actually occurring inside of here. And that's what's really, really nice. So even if a plugin doesn't work for you, all the code is available under the, usually the MIT license. Always check the license version there. And uh, you can actually just grab and implement that. Or hey, you know, open up an issue, and a lot of times things will be added or fixed into a plugin, and you can always contribute and fork it as well. So this is really, really nice. If you look at all this, all this code, over 260 some odd lines just for Android that you didn't have to write. So let's go ahead and install these puppies. So I'm going to go ahead and add some packages. So first thing I'm going to do is say geolocator. There we go. 
There's our geolocator. Fun fact, you can also type in the creator's name inside of here, and then that'll just show that creators all of the creator's packages that they have. So let's do that. So I'm going to go ahead and install. I've got a lot here. Where is it at? We want the geolocator plugin and also the text to speech plugin. Perfect. So that's going to add it there. Now I've added it to the PCL first. I'm also additionally going to go ahead and add those packages to our Android project and our iOS project. And we'll talk about why I'm doing this in the next part when we talk about how and why these things work. Cool. So now I'm going to come over here, add some more packages. I really like that it puts it right on top. Perfect. Lovely, lovely. Okay. So there we go. Now, if we don't use the city here in our code, we're going to want to go ahead and do some stuff. I'm going to put an else statement in here, copy in that code that I did earlier. And... Let's see here. It's probably going to be upset because it doesn't exist, so we'll go ahead and resolve out the geolocator.plugin. There it is. Get the current one. Desired. We don't need any of this stuff here, but we do definitely want the bar lat, the bar long. long. Grab this here. There we go. Perfect. Now what we can do is I can say whether root equals wait whether service dot get weather and we can see it takes in a lat and a long so lat long there we go and that should be good we'll take a break point there I'll take a break point down here and the last thing that we want to do here is get this weather message so I can say uh, cross text to speech dot current so, so that was the API. Resolve out that namespace. Dot speak. And we'll say weather message. Perfect. Lovely, lovely. Uh, if you guys have never seen uh, some of the new C Sharp 6 features, I'll go through that so this doesn't seem foreign to you guys uh, at all. So var test here. So this here, this temperature equals this current temp, that's actually equivalent to string.format this, zero. So that's what that's doing there. It's going to replace that, do some string interpolation there. And what this is doing is a null check. So this says, if this thing is null, uh, don't do anything, and this will return string.empty. It'll be null, else continue to weather. If the weather is null, then continue string.empty. And if this thing's null, these check are null propagation checks. So it's a, it minimizes a lot of your code. Lots of question marks. All right, so let's go ahead and run this now. So I'm going to go ahead and run this on the simulator, and I've literally inserted you know five or six lines of code into this application. So here's our iPhone simulator. Now, what would be interesting is that you probably won't be able to hear the speak back because it's in my ears. Let me see if I can unplug some stuff here. So I'll say Boston Mass. It's not going to actually hit any of this code because it's actually going through the old code. We can see this weather route, this temperature, everything in there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to unplug myself. Let's try it one more time here. See if you guys can hear this. The current temperature in Boston is temperature. 72 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm. So it looks like I definitely is temperature. Oh, that's because I made it temp. Perfect. What I really wanted to do is probably set it. will fix some bugs. So set this to big temp. Ooh. Lovely. Fix up some bugs. Hopefully you guys heard that. I'm not 100% sure if you did. I'm going to assume you did. We'll just assume that. Uh, but spoke back some text. Now let's try to run this over on Android. Here's the magical bits and pieces. I'm going to go ahead and set the Android as the startup project. And I'm actually on a physical device here. So it's going to use some real GPS location. Oh, I should actually come down here and let's run it one more time to show the second bit of this. Let's go ahead over here on iOS. Set that as a startup one more time. So it's one plus. Is that what I have? Not sure what's going on here. There we go. Forgot to use the GPS location. Let's try that out. 
Now, this is the simulator. So it's going to be using the simulator's GPS, which should be San Francisco, I believe. That's what Apple has it set to. All right, so I'm going to toggle this off. I'm going to say get weather. Built into the plugin is a, it allows you to actually do this and do the uh, access. It automatically will check for permission. We'll allow that. It's going to go off, and we can see the position here. When it comes back down, we have a latitude, longitude of 37, negative 122, speed's negative 1 because it's a simulator, and accuracy. And we'll go ahead and play this back. The current temperature in San Francisco is 70. Perfect. Now, it's using GPS location, it's using text-to-speech. I can come back over here now on Android, set that as the startup project. I'm going to start debugging here. I'm actually going to be screen mirroring this over here. Uh, there we go. This is a physical device. It's just a little Moto E, I think, like a $40 device. So, grab this here. All right, cool. So I can go in and we can say, uh, what's it doing in, let's see, Phoenix. I was just in Phoenix yesterday. There we go. Let's get the weather. It's going to hit some breakpoints. We'll get rid of that. The current temperature in Phoenix is 85. There we go. Cool. We got that. That's looking pretty good. Uh, and let's bring back a visor. There we go. Now if I toggle that off. Say so get weather, that should be using the current location, and we can see latitude, longitude, it's looking pretty good. We get the name here, let's see, let's go ahead and continue on. We can see the condition here, and Seattle is misty, that's classic Seattle, there's Seattle, and we continue on. The current temperature in Seattle is 56. Where'd my thing go? Where'd it go? There we go. Cool. So there we have it now working on both iOS and Android, pulling in these different plugins uh, for GPS and, uh, and text-to-speech. Now, I have a nice little test application that shows off some of my other plugins. So I'm going to go ahead and run through some of these, uh, and I'm just going to bring these up side by side. So we'll bring up Visor, we'll bring up this here, and we'll go ahead and pull these through. So let me go ahead and... First, change this over to this one. Oh, yeah, I actually have it on a physical device. So first I'll kind of show you this over here on, on Android. So here, for instance, these are some of the plugins that I created, and this is in my test sample project, so I can get the battery, there's the current battery, 88% charging on USB. I have connectivity, so am I connected? We can see I'm on Wi-Fi, different bandwidths that are coming on. My website's uh, reachable, which is very good, and that's really nice. So testing uh, internet connectivity. I could grab my contacts. There are no contacts on that phone, so that makes sense. Uh, I have device information here. Device information's pretty cool. It'll allow me to generate a unique app ID for my app get the model of my phone if I'm on iOS, Android, and different versions. If I'm on 5.1 here. That's actually kind of interesting. Uh, Xamarin Forms has device.os, so you can actually see if you're on phone, uh, or if you're on iOS, or you're on Android. The device information will let you do that in like a standard uh, Xamarin traditional application, which is nice. Of course, here's the geolocator, so I can say get GPS, and it's going to be pulling back the latitude, longitude, accuracy, speed if available. Uh, I also have uh, settings. So those are cross-platform settings. So if you're storing, let's say, hello in there, say save setting, it get the setting, it will return that setting to me. If I come back and forth into here, it's going to automatically save and persist those settings. Uh, Text-to-speech, vibrate. Can't really see vibrate, but maybe you can it's definitely vibrate in the device. 
Uh, and then the ability to get and take photos. So let's actually take a look at the same stuff. Oh, and external maps. This is a good one. Maybe you have to navigate to a location. It's actually going to pull up uh, Google Maps here. Yes, I'm in. First time launching it, I guess. So here we go. Ooh. Cool. So you can navigate. So let's say you need to navigate into your application. This is something that I used in the, um, the Xamarin Evolve application, for instance. Cool. So that's that. Let me go ahead and unplug this for Android. Sad face there. Let's plug in the uh, my iOS device. And I'm just going to pull quick time. Oops. There's this. And we're going to do a new movie recording. There's me. Hey, guys. How's it going? What we really want is my iPhone. There we go. And we don't want any of those photos. Cool. So here's the same exact application running. This is my test application. I can see my battery, so I can get my battery stats. For instance, I'm charging on AC. I can get my connectivity. There we go. I'm on Wi-Fi again. On iOS, as we can see, an IP address isn't available. So for instance, 127.001 isn't a valid, but my website is acceptable. Each platform's a little bit different. Device information, you can see I'm on iOS, 8.3. Uh, I think I actually do have some contacts on here. I have three, my family. That's good. I'm not going to show their personal information. Uh, external maps, geolocator, like we saw earlier. So go out, get the GPS location. Should pull it back. Of course, this isn't on cellular at all. It's only on Wi-Fi. There we go. Come back. Uh, media is kind of cool. You can uh, say take a photo. So here's our photo. Here's where I live. This is, there's a highway over there. There's an Android guy. I can take a photo of this thing. Looks good. Use that photo. That's going to put it in there. It sees where my file location's at. That's pretty cool. Take a video. Take a photo. Pick a photo. Uh, settings, again, that we saw earlier. Text to speed, vibrate, things that you would expect um, and have seen a little bit before. Now, it's, of course, very, very nice about all this is not only does it work on iOS or Android, if I swap over here to my uh, Windows PC, I actually have the same exact project. You'll see here, this is the project, my test application, running over here uh, on Windows Phone. So I come in, I can grab the battery percentage, full, it's on AC. Uh, I can grab the connectivity of this device. And this is all the same plugin coming in. Here, I can grab the device information. Windows Phone, specific version of Windows Phone. Uh, I can grab the geolocator information. So go out, grab that little geolocation information. There it is. Uh, and then, of course, a new media, settings, text-to-speech, vibrate, the things that you kind of would see, and they all run over here on Windows Phone and even some on Windows Store. So that's kind of the power here. And all this test application is doing is it has a bunch of pages, let's say battery, for instance, uh, where it just grabs the cross battery, dot current, dot remaining battery charge, very common API to access all of these different platform specific APIs, which is very, very cool. So now that can you do it in Xamarin Studio, you can do it in Visual Studio, anything you want. They're just NuGet packages, which is very cool. OK, let me come back over to PowerPoint real quick. So not only are plugins extremely powerful and offer a lot of capabilities, there's a lot of them out there like you've seen, you may be wondering now, how exactly do they work? How does this magic work? Well, it's pretty simple. We're actually leveraging how exactly portable class libraries work under the hood during compilation time. Normally, during portable class libraries, you're using it to share your models, your view models, things that are common in a lot of your .NET code or different NuGet packages you pull in. Uh, and, of course, here you can do iOS, Android, Windows Phone, etc. cetera. Uh, now, if you actually break down exactly what a portable class library is, it's two things. It's a reference assembly, uh, or as we like to call it, an API contract, and that's normally your, your interface, for instance. And then the second part of that is the implementation. Now, there's multiple ways of doing this and implementing a portable class library as far as an actual library library goes for distribution. Uh, you can think of it kind of like this. I don't know why this thing is kind of going a little bit off. But what we can see here is a normal native iOS application, a native Android application on top. 
And this could be Xamarin Forms. It may not be. It doesn't matter. Uh, but we have views uh, here, and then we're able to call into our view model. Now, normally the shared code right in the middle that we're looking at right here is our models, view models, and I kind of broke it apart into um, this, little, this little separate portable class library that we're creating, because normally, often, the API contract and the um, implementation live in the same exact part. So for instance, here what we're seeing is I call the VM, I hit the API contract, and normally, that's what I should say actually, implementation, the implementation will live there. And that's kind of the standard PCL or profile only approach. So you have an API contract and the implementation all in the same area. You can think of that kind of like JSON.NET, for instance, which is just one portable class library that's distributed. Uh, of course, you're going to be limited to the PCL subset, but they are easy to manage and easy to share. Now, that's not how plugins for Xamarin work. They leverage the ability to tap into platform-specific code. Notice I was accessing a common contract API, but under the hood, it was accessing the native implementation. So we have part one reference assembly, part two implementation. So for instance, we could kind of get a little bit crazy here. And how a plugin for Xamarin works under the hood is if we look at the very, very top and at the, the midsection, so the first top half, this is the same. I have a view, I call into a view model, our models here, um, I have a models, view models, and I call into a method. Now that method probably lives now in a separate portable class library, and it has an API contract and a little built-in IOC container. And what happens here is that it will contact and hit the API implementation with this built-in IOC. Notice these are kind of the same thing, but I'm implementing an iOS, implementing an Android. And there's a lot of arrows going on here. It may seem a little bit complex, because this is now getting into the creation part of it. As a consumer, cons in consuming these APIs, you don't have to worry about this. It just works. But here we can see the native iOS application references three things. The shared code, like it always has and always will. The portable class library containing the API contract. And finally, the iOS library containing the implementation. Now what's really interesting here is that Android will do the same. Now, normally you would think that the, this would actually, this is not going to work because it has some IOC container. You're going to need to worry about some things and it's going to do some things. But we can leverage this fact of how portable class libraries work at compile and runtime. We can leverage this thing called bait and switch. And it means that if you have a portable class library with that API contract and a platform binary, such as the iOS and Android library, and if they match three things, the assembly name, the version, and the class structure, at um, compile time and runtime, it'll swap, basically, and replace the PCL binary with the platform binary, which is interesting. So imagine that you have a dummy implementation in your portable class library, and you have the real implementation in your Android library, and it'll swap that out. So this is what happens. We remove that middleman that's going on here. So our shared code, when it calls the, VM, uh, the view model method to call that API contract, it kind of all gets bundled into one library that's used in our running application. So now, instead of having that other portable class library, DLL, that does actually exist and is in, is in there, everything is now kind of bundled up into one runtime and it's merged together. It's very magical. So, bringing it down, you have a portable class library abstraction, which is your interface. You implement it three times on iOS, Android, and Windows. And then you pop that puppy right into a NuGet package. When you consume that NuGet package, it figures out all of this automatically during the compilation steps. So how would we create that? That's how they work. How do you create them? Well, we leverage exactly what I just saw. You would create an abstraction, PCL, with an interface. You create an implementation on each platform, and then you create a NuGet package. And what that looks like, and I'll show you here inside of Visual Studio, is kind of what the project structure looks like. This is the connectivity plugin. You can pull it down for yourself that I have up on GitHub. But there's a lot of things going on here. In fact, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different projects all bundled up into there just to create one plugin. So let's break it down. First is the subtractions. Uh, this is what will get installed in every single project, and it is any of our interfaces, common classes, common enums that will be used in any of our different projects. 
So for instance, one of the enums that I have here is a connection type, which would be Wi-Fi, cellular, um, things like that. Then up here, we have our plugin, uh, which is our core internal IOC. This gets installed in not only our portable class library that we're going to be calling from our view, with our view models, um, but this is what's going to use that bait and switch, that cross connectivity. So for instance here, if I go to each platform, they're all going to look very much the same. This is the implementation of the connectivity. What we're seeing is there's this bait and switch IOC. So cross connectivity, which is the same exact, it's actually a link. You can see a little link icon right here, that little blue link icon. It's actually the same exact class, and it's using if defs. And we'll take a look at that and what's going on. We're using different if defs there. So those will be switched at runtime in and out which is very, very interesting. So it's not just that it's going to swap the entire DLL. It's going to swap the class structures and the methods at runtime that needs to do. Cool. So let's take a look at how this would work. Now, I'm not going to create eight different structures there. That would be very tedious and kind of creating all these different projects over and over. So, uh, and in fact, that's what I used to do when I got started. Uh, I would go in and I would create all these different projects over and over and over again. And I thought that that was tedious. So what I did is if I go into Visual Studio and go into Extensions and Updates, and I look at Templates, a whole bunch of different templates here. Uh, but I created this thing called Plugin for Xamarin Templates. Uh, I created this a while ago. It has quite a few. Let's take a look here on the online. So if you just say uh, Templates Xamarin, that's it. There we go. So there's two that I made. There's also a Google Glass one, which is kind of cool. Where's my... There we go. So I also have a Xamarin Android pack, and I have this one. Didn't download about 4,000 times. Not bad. So this is for the, the, the creator of the, the plugins at this point. So if you want to get active and start doing this. So I've installed this plugin for Xamarin templates. And now what I can do is I can say File, New Project. Let's actually close down this Windows phone. Let's see if uh, Visual Studio will be happy with me. Will let Visual Studio maybe do its thing? We'll see. There we go. Cool. Sometimes you just got to wait a little bit longer. All right. So you have all your standard iOS, Android. And if you tap on Visual C Sharp, go down here, and we will see plugin for Xamarin. Now, I have a very special way of doing and creating these libraries. So for instance here, I'll say uh, this is cool feature. Feature. There you go. So that's what I want to implement. I'm going to put it wherever. It doesn't matter. But it's a plugin for Xamarin. Go ahead and hit OK. It's going to take a few seconds here. What this is going to do is going to create the entire project structure required to start and build your own plugin for Xamarin. There we go. It's going to spin up tons of projects. I'm going to reload whatever it asked me to do. There we go. Oh, come on, Visual Studio. Oh. Apparently upset the Visual Studio. There we go. Cool. There's a lot of things going on here. So let me go ahead and drop this all down so you can actually see what's going on. Uh, now what's nice here is that you know I spin up every single different uh, different one here. So there's the plugin, the abstractions, Android, iOS, Windows Phone, et cetera, et cetera. You don't have to support all these. You can just support the ones you want. I like it supporting as many as humanly possible. Sometimes it doesn't make any sense. 
Or sometimes you can just put a dummy implementation inside of the Windows Phone or store that doesn't do anything. That's also a valid use case. So our abstractions here are interesting. It's just an interface that we would implement. I cool feature. And then what we're going to see here is if I actually right click and I go to properties and why and how this all works is that I have an assembly name of coolfeature.plugin and coolfeature.plugin. Now, if I go to the Android one, which is coolfeature.plugin.android, the reason bait and switch can work, so we set these up in a very interesting way. Let me go ahead and open this project structure here. There we go. So here, for instance, we can see that the assembly name and the default are actually the same. So in the actual plugin templates, I've automatically set up the assembly names to match and the version information. So this is really cool. What we can see under Android is that not only does it have the cool feature implementation that'll be used of iCool feature, it's referencing and linking to this cross cool feature. So let's take a look at that. Here we go. This thing here uh, creates a cool feature, if you will. It's going to create the base class it needs to, whatever is implemented by. So how this works is that it has a little internal IOC of current iCool feature. It says if there is an implementation, return that implementation, else throw this not implemented in reference assembly. This is a very common practice. That was done uh, actually by the .NET team when they were creating PCL storage, which is a very cool cross-platform file storage plugin. And you can see if I'm in the portable class library, it returns null, else it's going to use our cool feature. And this is the class that's swapped basically automatically. Because if I go into the Android version of it, and I close this here, open this up, and it's just a linked file, you can see that it is going to return our cool feature. So that's what's swapped there at runtime. So there's not actually a lot of bait and switching happening in this implementation. It's just literally swapping out a little bit of this cool feature that's going on, this class at runtime. So here, for instance, I could then start implementing this feature, and we'd be good to go. I do it on Android. I do it over here on iOS. Unified or not unified, it's up to you. I mean, unified is always what you want to do, but if you want to need to support old or non-unified. Uh, and then you would do it here on Windows Phone, et cetera, et cetera. And you would be good to go. Now, the tricky part here is, of course, uh, creating the NuGet package and actually uploading it up there. Now, I'm using the current older structure of NuGet packaging that's out there, uh, but it's still totally valid. Uh, so here, if I say add new item into this solution, you'd have to figure out how to create this NuGet package, do all this stuff. But what I'm going to do here is just spin up and initialize an item template. So this will go ahead and initialize. I just installed some new updates yesterday. There we go. And when you install that plugin template pack, there's a plugin for Xamarin and NewSpec. You want to, if you name it exactly the same, so cool feature, and hit add, this will automatically create uh, the entire plugin for you. It'll give you the cool, uh, the core, the Windows Phone, Windows Store, Android, iOS, and it does all the linking, everything to you. All you have to do is build in release mode, and that would be it. Now, of course, you can go ahead and add sample test projects into this application, but this creates everything for you. Uh, you can add your description, short description. You can put your own icon, or I give you, uh, there's a template uh, that are, or a default. But you'd insert a few things, such as your license URL, project URL, your name. And you can see I give a default tier of cool feature plugin for Xamarin and Windows. So you can update that at will, but um, you always want to put your name as the, the DLL. Notice that I never use... Xamarin, I never use Microsoft, I never use a company name. You'd either use your name or your, uh, your company's name or some LLC, something like that. Um, so there's no name conflicting there. Uh, often you'll see that I use Xam, X-A-M. I never use Xamarin uh, because I don't want to have a conflict with other potential things in the future from Xamarin itself. Even though I work for Xamarin, it's not an official Xamarin NuGet package. So I don't want people to be confused. So there we go. And then you would just follow the normal new, NuGet distribution to do that. But at this point, I've at least somehow, hopefully, um, sped up the process of creating these plugins. Now, of course, if you just want to consume the plugins, always take a look here 
on that GitHub page, if I go to Xamarin, github.com slash Xamarin dot GitHub, um, github.com slash Xamarin slash plugins, you can always see all the available plugins that we've kind of gone through. Get the NuGet, get the GitHub. You can create your own pull request to add your own or create your own issue for things that you want to see have done or if you're developing your own inside of here. And we can always add or just simply create an issue or a pull request. And we'll take a look and add you into this list. So let's go back here. Perfect. Now these slides will be available. I'll give them to Rob, wherever he wants to put them. There's lots and lots of different resources to get you going. Of course, uh, the plugins for Xamarin, that GitHub repo, is going to be linked here. Uh, but I also created a short little uh, bit.ly for the plugin templates at bit.ly slash plugin templates. And that's going to give you a very long URL, but you basically just want to go into Visual Studio to grab the uh, templates pack. Uh, if you want to read more about portable class libraries and how they work, we have tons of documentation on developer.xamarin.com where you learn about cross-platform folder or um, structure of your applications. And there's two very, very interesting parts that I covered a little bit here, which is some detail with the bait and switch. Paul Betts from Slack, um, actually a good friend of mine, uh, he gave an entire uh, blog on the bait and switch PCL trick. It's very, very in-depth, and he goes down to assembly what's actually being compiled so if you want to learn more, check out paulbetts.org and his blog um, that he did not too long ago. And finally, another one of our Xamarin MVPs, not only Paul Betts, but Michael Ridlin, he gave a really great blog post about not, how, not just how much he loves plugins for Xamarin, but also some best practices when it comes to unit testing around it. Uh, and when you dive into this, what you actually see is a, a pretty good approach. So I'll go ahead and actually... Can open that here. So he talks about more about kind of passing in specific interfaces. All those interfaces are available to you. So for instance, here he passes in an iUser dialog and that he could mock out. And I actually have a really good example of that here. So for instance, if I come back into my weather view model, I have a settings plugin here. And if I come back over into my helpers, I have the settings class. And this is how I like to actually structure my, my plugins. So for instance, here, as you can see, I'm internally using this iSettings, app settings, that I'm always accessing. So instead of directly accessing crosssettings.current, I'm actually going and using, um, uh, I have the ability to swap this out. So if I wanted to say, you know, something in here, which was, if I am in, uh, in a, you know, n unit test, you know, return my own implementation. I was to pseudocode this, else return current. So for instance here, you could do some logic in here um, to do this current. Because as we saw, if it doesn't exist in the actual platform specific code, it's not going to be able to do that bait and switch and it's going to throw an exception. So it's very important. Uh, if you're running on a device such as in test cloud, you're not going to have to worry because it's on a physical device and it's going to be run as part of the package. But if you're running like n unit tests for instance, or you have some special um, case or you have some crazy, you know, Windows background service or something like that that maybe uh, won't access those, you want to make sure that you do this. That's very, very nice. So here, for instance, I have this cross settings uh, here where I can save the you know, use city or the default city that I have here. Uh, here. So that's kind of what you would want to do. And I kind of, you could just have a single static helper class to return all of these plugins. So maybe a plugin helper that will return just even this code would be good enough to do it that way. Or you could pass it in and use your own IOC container to resolve out that interface, because this interface is available to you. Because I could always come in and say public class mock settings, and say i settings. There we go. Then of course I could come in, I could fix this, implement that interface, boom. And you can do all this and literally just return whatever you need to based off of this because all of it is available to you. So kind of best practices there that I could wanted to cover in just a few seconds. There's always questions that come up around that. Perfect. So all these resources are available. Really great blog posts um, from, from our amazing Xamarin MVPs and people in the community, and also amazing plugins as well. So I really hope and would love to hear if you're using plugins for Xamarin. I would love to always add your application to uh, my actual repo if you're using some of my plugins. I'd love to do that, give you some you know, a uh, free promotion. I'll create a little section on my, my main uh, um, thing there. 
That'd be really cool. So I always like to hear, you know, what you guys are using and what apps you guys are creating. Uh, and with that, I'll open it up for questions. And of course, feel free after this. Uh, you can always contact me at any time. Great. So James, there are some questions. If you look over in the Go to Training uh, window, you should see a questions section. So if you want to go ahead and answer there, there it looks like there's four of them there. And uh, if you can just read the questions, so we have it on the recording. That'd be great. Hmm. Um, I don't have any you questions can... showing up. Okay. Well, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you can read them off, and I'll see I what will I can read do. them. Uh, so Matt was asking: Is it possible to create a plugin that overrides an existing control on just one of the platforms, but displays the default on the others? For example, if I wanted to change the way a Xamarin Forms label is displayed on Android, but just have the standard Xamarin Forms rendering on iOS and Windows Phone. Sure. So that's a great question. So I didn't cover that. Okay. So the nice thing that I'll cover here, it's a two part question. The first part was not asked, but I will cover specifically. Uh, so plugins for Xamarin, while I demoed a lot of Xamarin Forms applications, plugins for Xamarin and Windows themselves can be used on any application for iOS, Android, Windows, Xamarin Forms, traditional, it doesn't matter. They can be used anywhere. So if you're building with Xamarin Forms, you're good to go. If you're building for uh, um, traditional approach, you're good to go. Now, often on NuGet, what you will see is um, feature blank plugin for Xamarin Forms. And that is usually a control, or it's some sort of control out there that, um, or some very, something very specific to Xamarin Forms that had to use some of the internal Xamarin Forms, like navigation or something like that, to pull off some effect. And in that case, I, I kind of discourage creating things specifically for Xamarin Forms except for controls. And even then, controls are tricky because it's, it's what Xamarin Forms is built against. So, but I do have one, for instance, my image circle control. Now, how custom renderers, now you're actually just getting into custom renderers. How custom renderers work, let's say my image circle, for instance, uh, which is a, a circle image that um, is, is, is of type image. If I was to only implement a custom render on one platform, it would just use the default of everything else. Everything else would be ignored, uh, because if you don't have a custom render, it just uses the default for you automatically. So that's just out of the box how custom renderers work on Xamarin Forms, is if you were to um, create your own um, custom control, you would just um, only implement the ones that you want, else it'll use the default implementation. You don't have to do it on all three platforms. All right, so the next question then is, what's the difference between plugins and what Xamarin calls components, if any? Great question. So, oh, cancel. Great question. So, uh, actually I actually have a blog for this. Lots, codes, plugins, first, components. I do, I have a nice little blog, it's called What Exactly is a Plugin? And there's the, the component versus plugins. So, well, when we refer to components, uh, normally what we're talking about is a specific library, specifically only for iOS or only for Android. Or it's some cross-platform library such as Azure Mobile Services, which is high level, doesn't actually tap into a lot of native feature functionality, but it's a gen generic library component that you would want to use. Uh, for instance, you know, Twilio, uh, and, and then often sometimes they have specific APIs for each platform. Twilio, for instance, has very tight integration into iOS and Android that they couldn't write an abstraction for. Remember, plugins for Xamarin are an abstraction of common, common things. A plugin is usually always a NuGet, and it adds that cross-platform functionality, abstracts, away, abstracts it away into a common API. Um, and it's all about being cross-platform and extremely small with very minimal um, dependencies. And what's really nice here, I should mention, that if you actually go to components.xamarin.com, you will find a plugin section. And a plugin can be a, um, a component, because you could install a plugin in just one application. Let's say um, Rob over here. Uh, Mr. Gibbons, is writing only an iOS application. He's not even doing portable class libraries. He's being maybe not the, the greatest cross-platform developer, but he's putting all the code only in the iOS application and not doing any portable class libraries. Not what I would tell him to do, but, you know, that's, it's his decision. 
and maybe he wants to use the connectivity plugin. He could install connectivity plugin only into iOS and use the API only in iOS. You don't have to only use it in a portable class library. You can use it just in Android, just in iOS, or from your shared code. So the difference here is that normally a component, we refer to it, is something very specific, something a control on the screen or specific library built for iOS or built for Android um, that's out there today. A plugin is an abstraction over these common APIs. Now, a good example of a plugin that I know Alan Ritchie is working on uh, is a plugin for beacons. So for instance, abstracting the Estimo APIs, there's a specific uh, Android SDK, a specific iOS SDK. However, you could then create an abstraction of those APIs to do that. And then that would be a plugin with two components underneath the hood. So uh, you can read a little bit more on my blog, Mott's Codes, but that's exactly potentially what it is. A component, specific library for iOS or Android, where a plugin is a subtraction across the board. Excellent. So that, uh, I think, answers another question we had from uh, Matt, which was, can you create a plugin for just one platform so that uh, on that one platform it's going to render something, but on others it does nothing? I think you just answered that. Uh, you definitely could do that if you wanted to. And it uh, looks like our last question, unless anybody else wants to put some more questions in the, the go to training window, is what software did you use to mirror Android on the, on the laptop and the Mac? Uh, correct. So this is a application uh, called Visor. It's created by Kush, who um, is a pretty awesome gentleman. That's Kush. He works at is the founder of Clockwork Mod. Uh, so Visor.io. There it is. It's a free. It's a Chrome extension. So that's the URL right up there. V y s o r dot i o from Kush. It's an excellent gentleman. Uh, it just screen mirrors anything over um, for Mac, PC, Linux, over Chrome, wherever Chrome can run. And you can click and browse and everything like that. I additionally have a blog. Let's go screen sharing. I have lots of blogs. <laughs> so basically, if you're wondering what I'm doing, if you just say Mots code screen mirroring, I have this entire blog post, which is very, very nifty, on how to screen mirror any of your different devices from iOS, uh, Android and Windows Phone across the board and uh, on there as well. So if you want to know if you're only on a PC or you don't have Chrome or something, I use MobiZen a lot or Reflector application. Lots of good one. Visor is really nice. It's a new, it's in beta. Yeah, I use Visor as well. It, it's really nice in that, it, like you said, it's not just mirroring, but you can actually click on it from your computer and have it uh, click on stuff on the device, which is really nice. Yep. All right, so I don't see any more questions. Again, if you have any, put it in now. You're running out of time. But thank you so much, James. Uh, that was a fantastic presentation, as always. And for everyone else, remember that these guest lectures are recorded, and they're going to be exclusively, exclusively available to Xamarin University students in the next few days, along with any materials that James has for us. We'll get those up there as well. And our next lecture is next Thursday. Remember, we have four guest lectures here in September for Back to School. The next one's next Thursday at 8 a.m. Pacific time or 3 p.m. GMT. And that's going to be Xamarin's Pierce Bogan telling us about custom renderers in Xamarin form. So make sure you register for that. Uh, we've got lots of great stuff coming up. Other than that, thank you to everyone for attending. And thank you once again to James. And we'll see you all in class.